Welcome to the Rerooted Podcast with Francesca Maxime, trauma-sensitive mindfulness meditation teacher and poet. Together, we'll take a closer look at approaches to transforming trauma with insights from psychology, neuroscience, spirituality, social justice, and the creative arts. Join Francesca and her guests for an exploration of our shared connection and how we can cultivate greater compassion for ourselves and for others. If you'd like to support Francesca and the Rerooted Podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Francesca. Hi, everyone. I'm Francesca Maxime, and welcome to Rerooted, where we really kind of look down into what's underneath and, and um, what's growing and, and what do we want to grow and, and how do we make things grow over time. I'm here today with a very special guest, Dr. James R. Doty. He's the director and founder of um, CCARE, Clinical Professor of Neurosurgery at Stanford University. Uh, he's the founder and the director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford, of which His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the founding benefactor and works with scientists from a number of disciplines examining the neural bases for compassion and altruism, which is really just so um, so terrific. And he's also the New York Times bestselling author of Into the Magic Shop, a neurosurgeon's quest to discover the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. Uh, welcome, Dr. Doty. It's such a pleasure to have you on here today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. And it's always a uh, pleasure to um, share, talk, and uh, be rerouted, if you will. Yeah, really. It, it, it is an intentional name um, to kind of get back to, I think, what we all kind of feel in some ways is that original nature from which we become separated. And, and, um, and I would beg to say that perhaps you would, you would suggest that that nature is, is a compassionate one. No, I think that's right. I think, unfortunately, when we have um, trauma in our lives, when we feel scared, uh, insecure, lost, uh, that we have a tendency to uh, feel that it's us against them or we're uh, by ourselves. And, uh, you know, the reality is the nature of most of us uh, is to be kind, to be caring. The problem is that for many, we don't want to share that we're hurt uh, because we want to put up this uh, projection of who we want people to see us as. And as a result, uh, we're not authentic, we're not open. And then people don't then know that we're suffering. And so uh, it's interesting because uh, I give talks a lot. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have no problem uh, being emotional. I mean, my voice will crack or I will shed a tear. And it's interesting. As soon as I do that, everyone starts crying. <laughs> uh, and the reason is, is because you've shown that you're not afraid to be authentic and allows them to be truly authentic. And I think uh, that's an important thing to remember because you can't help someone unless you know they're suffering. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. And would it be fair to say that the human condition as, um, again, we're on Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network informed by mindfulness practices and ancient wisdom teachings from um, a variety of disciplines, would it be fair to say then that, that part of that suffering is just part of the human condition? No, you're absolutely right. I don't think uh, um, there's any way uh, to get away from that reality. But you also have to understand that also the nature of suffering of in times is something we have created. Uh, fear, uh, ego, craving, attachment, those are the things that cause suffering. And this is not to imply that they're not external uh, events that are responsible for suffering, but a great deal of human suffering is self created because you don't see the true nature of reality. Well, absolutely. And um, the true nature of reality, I think that's the whole, the whole point, right, of, of the Buddhist teachings anyway, is, is what is preventing us from the clear seeing. And in this case, what I hear you saying in, in a different way is that the conditioning around the way that we feel like we are supposed to be in the world, especially per, perhaps in the Western world and, and Certainly, in the world, um, I think that that you've inhabited, having you know gained everything, and and people who 
you know, have read your book already know this, and I'd, I'd love for you to share more about this, but from um, rising from a place of, of poverty and challenge to the highest peaks of um, uh, the medical profession and also entrepreneurially and, and now, um, you know, the giving back um, philanthropic aspects that, you know, continue to grow in your practice, including this podcast itself, um, that, that our ways of being conditioned in this Western world are often not uh, around a collectivist kind of cultural mentality, but more this sort of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and head west, young man, you know, um, solo. Whereas we really know that um, that mammalian interconnectivity is really kind of what sustains us, not only physically, but emotionally. Well, you're right. I mean, as a species, uh, uh, we thrive in the context of social connection. Uh, the narrative that is, you mentioned, uh, this uh, rugged individualism, if you will, uh, is a false narrative. There's not a single one of us who has thrived in any way uh, without benefit from other people. And this is what some people forget. Uh, the other aspect is that um, when people grow up in challenging circumstances, and you alluded to my own background of poverty, uh, uh, alcoholism and, uh, with my father. My mother had had a stroke and uh, was chronically depressed, attempted suicide, being evicted, etc. Oftentimes, uh, you have such hopelessness, despair, and anger, hostility at the world. And um, what happens is that you carry this with you. And the nature of our species is that we can intuit people's emotional states. And when you carry those types of feelings, people sense them. And then it impacts how they interact with you. And the thing is that at some point, you choose the path of either fear or love. And unfortunately, for some people who survive such a circumstance, they say to themselves, nobody helped me. I did it on my own. Uh, people were mean to me and I don't know anybody, anything. And uh, I made it so they have to make it. And I don't care about anybody. And I sadly, uh, that's not an uncommon narrative uh, for a lot of people who've risen above situations like this. The problem is though, it, it's a path that creates separation, loneliness and constant anger within yourself. The other path, I think, and hopefully one that I've chosen, is to be so empathic that you sense that uh, others are suffering, and whether it's obvious or not, and you know what suffering's like. And as a result, uh, you reach out and uh, offer acceptance, uh, non-judgment, uh, openness, uh, and love. Mm -hmm. And that cures many, many wounds. You know, I say that um, people have wounds of the heart, and most of them um, heal quickly. Uh, but there's some that are so deep and don't heal. And those are the ones, unfortunately, uh, that dictate negative actions because they don't know how to heal those wounds. And they're always so painful that they impact every behavior, every action, every thought. And it's how do we uh, heal those uh, wounds of the heart. And um, my own experience has been uh, to uh, show them, to be open, to be honest, uh, to show that you're suffering. And the natural human instinct when we see another suffering is to reach out, to embrace them, to hold them. Um, and the power of that uh, should never be taken for granted. Mm, mm. Beautiful, that embracing, that holding, that allowing that accepting, that just meeting, that, that attunement, that I, I see you. I, I see you in your suffering, just like me, you suffer. 
just like me. Exactly. And, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe hard in the modern world, but it's so, so powerful. Um, and it should never be taken for granted. Uh, what people also forget is that within them is that power to profoundly, profoundly affect another's life in a positive way. And sadly, unfortunately, also in a negative way. Mm -hmm. you no, know, sometimes just a smile, uh, just an embrace, uh, just a sense of understanding can profoundly, profoundly affect how someone uh, perceives the world, uh, perceives their place in the world, and perceives their opportunities in the world. And we should never forget that. Uh, I hear from people, well, I'm just X, Y, or Z, and I don't have any power, and I'm not in any position, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not true. Each of us every day has the capacity uh, to improve at least one person's life. Yeah, beautiful. I love this. And a few things are coming to mind right now um, as you're speaking. One is that the um, magic shop that you had gone into, that that was the kind of care and attention and meeting that you that you got. And for those who haven't read the book, again, I encourage you to do so into the magic shop, a neurosurgeon's quest to discovery, discovery, quest to discovering the mysteries of the brain and secrets of the heart. Um, cool. In any case, that that was what she was doing with you there. Uh, I would, I would surmise. Yes. And that it's something that we each can do and that um, to bring it um, to where we are right now, um, that we are in the midst of this um, quite viral um, scenario where many of us are working from home. Many of us are um, quarantining where this social distancing and how it's, it's more of a challenge, right. In, in our everyday lives, like when we had, quote unquote, a regular day to day um, a few months ago, holding a door for someone, smiling at someone, those things, there were, there were plentiful opportunities there. And, and how do we do that now, perhaps, given that um, we have maybe a new normal that we're shifting to for whatever period of time we don't know, um, where we're virtually interacting in, in greater spaces and, and doing things. How would you say compassion and action looks like given what we have uh, now? Well, I think there are a couple of things. Uh, I was recently in Belfast <clears throat> and um, there's a statue um, there and I don't know if you've ever seen it. I'm not religious, but uh, the statue is particularly impactful and it's called Homeless Jesus. Have you ever seen this? I have not, but already it's impactful so, in its name. Uh, <laughs> So it's a statue uh, at its park bench, and on the park bench uh, is an individual covered partially in a blanket. And uh, uh, both feet are out from under the blanket, I think one hand, and it shows the, the, um, from the uh, being nailed to the cross, his injuries. Um, but the interesting uh, thing about it is, and at least for me, the purpose is you know, we take the suffering of others for granted. We see homeless people, we see people suffering, and oftentimes uh, we walk right by them. And, uh, you know, that's something that's in front of us, uh, and we walk by. Uh, we walk by more easily with people who don't appear to be suffering. But, you know, in the context of the present situation, uh, in fact, I posted this actually uh, on Facebook, uh, which is um, don't let fear destroy your humanity. Mm. Because what happens is, again, when you become afraid, anxious, you panic, you start creating all these narratives that aren't true because what you've done is you've shut down your executive control function part of your brain because you're in, uh, you've um, uh, stimulated your sympathetic nervous system. And as a result, uh, again, you have a tendency to not think clearly and you have all these deleterious effects in your um, physiology that start kicking in. And uh, so I think an important thing is to sort of pause and try to not let fear overtake you and be more realistic and thoughtful uh, and objective. The other thing is that um, 
the interesting thing about this situation in some ways, uh, if there is any gift from it, is that it's making us understand it's okay uh, to be socially distanced in the sense that, as an example, I have a wife and two children and uh, uh, I don't get to spend as much time with them. And uh, when I f was first in that situation, I'm going, oh my God, this is annoying. Kids, be quiet. <laughs> but, you know, over the last 24 hours or so, I go, wow, this is an incredible gift. We get to hang out, we can read books, watch a movie, we go for a walk. And actually, uh, in some ways, that is a very nice side effect of this to be able to be with those you love uh, and not be distracted completely by all these electronics or I have to go here, I have to be there. And there's some sense that you always have to be doing something versus simply just being. And I think uh, that's a potential wonderful side effect of this. Now, it's horrible that people are suffering and being ill and dying, of course. Uh, and that is what it is. But again, it, uh, you should be thankful that if you do have the means to be with your family, uh, spend time together in the face of this horrible tragedy worldwide, that is a side effect of this uh, that is positive. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to look at that side. Obviously, you have me in my office. I'm in my scrubs and a white coat. So I'm at the hospital seeing patients and taking care of people. But that being said, I think um, sometimes it's okay to be alone. Sometimes it's okay uh, not to think about all these other things that you think are important because, frankly, most of what we do is not that important. You know, I used to believe one time in my career, I had to do this, I had to do that. I need to be this because I'm so great and people need me. And wow, you know, I'm able to do this and that. And you know, this is a narrative of insecurity. Sometimes you don't need to do anything. And you know, there's this concept of FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. Mm. And that for many people, when you're insecure in yourself, you feel you have to be out there so people will tell you that you're great or I got invited to this exclusive event or, you know, wow, people gave me this accolade. And all of that is nothing uh, because all the outside stuff at the end of the day is meaningless. The only thing uh, at the end of the day that's important is uh, who you are inside. Mm. that's the truth right uh uh it's not what people think about you it's what you think about yourself and when you have the right inter inner dialogue then that allows you to have the correct outer appearance and action yeah, I really love what you're saying. And I also love that, again, speaking with Dr. James Doty, the clinical professor of neurosurgery at Stanford University here on the Rerooted podcast on the Re Round Us Be Here Now Network, really just underscoring that um, the relationship that you have to yourself, that inner dialogue, um, that, that that's paramount, that that's really, really critical. And um, because of the work that you do and, and your, your understanding of the um, physiology and the nervous system and the synaptic subcortical responses and, you know, fusions and things, how we get wired to believe what we believe, right? I work with clients all day about uncoupling as a somatic experiencing, you know, trauma healing practitioner, uncoupling well, this part of you came to believe this. There was an experience that was juxtaposed or fused here. And is that true? There's a part that believes that it, it, it feels real, that you're going to die or that you're going to be abandoned or that you'll be rejected. But can we pull apart you having a voice and asking for what you need from what it believes is the repercussion that would have happened at seven, that it would have been left alone or rejected or not getting the love and attention that it craved if it spoke up? And all of the things that go along with that, for example, in this example around, I'm not worthy. I'm not a good person unless I'm doing for others or something maybe in a more, this is, was a, a feminine, you know, a, a woman uh, client, you know, from a masculine thing about achievement. Like if I have this or I do this or whatever. So perhaps you can talk a little bit about how that's actually built up in a way from the inside out, um, that healthy self-esteem and what's happening 
maybe subcortically or physiologically when we do that with compassion practices and other practices? Well, one of the things that people don't appreciate uh, is that so many of us have this negative self-talk. And that negative self-talk we think is real and is us. And this negative self-talk can occur secondary to trauma, where you have the sense of worthlessness or shame from different events. And then we keep repeating that narrative to ourselves. As an example, the reason this happened is because of me. The reason uh, you know I was molested, or the reason uh, I was not loved by my father, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is because it was my fault. And um, certainly, as a child, it's never your fault. Uh, period. Uh, um, but we have a tendency to repeat these negative narratives, and the reason is that as a species, when we were on, as an example, the savannah in Africa. When we were fed, uh, we were not hungry. When we were satiated, we didn't worry about anything. But uh, things that put us at risk, as an example, we see the grass moving and we know probably there's a lion or some animal there that's gonna put us at risk. We remember those things. And the sad thing is that because of the way that type of wiring occurred, negative commentary, negative events, negative things stick to us more than positive things. And uh, as a result, we create these narratives about we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, I'm an imposter. If they really knew me, they wouldn't like me, et cetera, et cetera. And people are so often much more uh, unkind to themselves than anyone else. And when you say, I can't, when you say I'm not good enough, when you say it's not possible, by definition, that becomes fact. Because if you say you can't run very far, then you don't. And um, what happened to me in that magic shop with this woman named Ruth, who gave me some insights into how I was limiting uh, my view, what she made me understand that every time I made a comment like that, it was as if I was laying a brick down and building a prison for myself. And the mm. more I laid down, uh, the darker it got, and to the point where I could barely see the light. What happens in that situation is that the power which each of us has, which is really quite extraordinary, we forget we have. And we, in fact, we think we don't have any power whatsoever. But when you're able to understand that that's a false narrative, it's not real, it's not you, then suddenly you can uh, break out of that prison, or if you will, you're given the key to open the door to the prison, and you then understand that you have extraordinary power that you never thought you had. Mm -hmm. When you understand how much power you have, that then remarkable things happen. And uh, it's just, you just have to change how you see the world. And for me, that period in the magic shop made me change from a narrative of this is not possible to understanding that anything is possible. And it certainly guided me to believe that I could go to college, to medical school. Uh, as you know, I was also an entrepreneur and to do the things that I do. And here I am blessed to not only have achieved in a variety of domains, which people would call success, but more importantly, to meet some of the greatest uh, spiritual and religious leaders in the world who uh, have been so kind to just be with me or allow me to be with them and to have more understanding of um, what I would say again is the true nature of reality. The interesting thing about an evolved spiritual being, and I would put the Dalai Lama or Amma or Ram Das or some of these other individuals, what is it that we know? Uh, the amazing thing that I found is that it's not about the dogma. Mm -hmm. uh, these individuals can intuit and individuals um, 
emotional state, their authenticity, who they are, really in a microsecond. And it has to do with, do you care? Do you love? Do you have an open heart? Do you judge? And if you can get to the point of openness, acceptance, understanding that, and this is truly uh, um, transcendence, when you get to the point when you see the other as yourself, then you truly have evolved and you see the true nature of reality. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Seeing the other as yourself as the true nature of reality, going back to your homeless Jesus, um, you know, uh, image, that sculpture in a way. I'm thinking um, that again, um, Sharon Salzberg talks about, um, you know, mindfulness teacher that, you know, is often um, teaching here in New York and also obviously on this network and very well known for her meta meditation of the loving kindness. Um, she talks about that a lot when, you know, she meets the eyes of someone in the street in New York who is without a home. And um, what does it mean to actually be met there in that place and to be seen and to have them see you and to share that connection? No, that's uh, right. Sharon's a, such a joy. Uh, her and I did a program together up in Sun Valley a few years ago. Mm. And in fact, when my book came out in New York, she was kind enough to uh, uh, do a reading with me in Brooklyn, I think it was. So. Yeah, beautiful. That's where I am. So next next one you write, come on down and do another one. Uh, um, you know, it's interesting you, you point that out um, because uh, when you can understand that uh, with one or two things different in your life, you could be laying on that bench. Well, there but for the grace of God go I is the old saying that I know from my Catholic upbringing. Yes, exactly. So uh, I think uh, understanding that and always carrying that reality with you and not get too smug in your sense of self-import. Um, again, um, I think, you know, uh, being able to sit with another regardless of who they are. You know, I tell a story of um, when I was in college, I um, worked in a liquor store. And this, uh, and there would be a man who would come in every day and buy a quart of uh, vodka. And uh, being the immature uh, individual, even though I had been with truth, I was still not quite um, where I am today. And uh, um, I would make fun of him, you know, because he had always had the bleary eyed and disheveled. And um, uh, he gave me an incredible gift one day because he confronted me. Because mm -hmm. I was judging him and making some assumptions about who I thought he was and basically that he had no value, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, here I am with father who's an alcoholic and I'm doing this. Mm. Uh, and so, and I'm sure there's some psychodynamic there as well, but anyway, he called me on it. And uh, then he actually went into a very loud narrative about me knowing not anything about him. So then he told me, and the story was he had been a professor at my university. Um, <clears throat> He had a daughter who died, uh, and uh, he and his wife grieved uh, for her. Uh, then his wife got cancer and died. Mm. Yeah, and take a moment because this is the connection. So his world fell apart. Yeah. And uh, he started drinking to deal uh, with his own pain. Right. So, um, so what happened is, of course, I was shocked and felt horrible. Uh, and he left. But he came back the next day. And this time, we talked a little bit more. Um, and then <clears throat> what happened is, as we talked more and more, the volume of alcohol inspired <laughs> started decreasing. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Uh, to the point uh, 
where after like six months, no longer was there this disheveled man, but he started dressing as if he cared. And then he was only buying a pint of vodka. Then he shifted to uh, the uh, little air, airline bottles. Right, right. Uh, and then he stopped, but he still came in. Um, and over the course of that time, he and I had many conversations. Mm. And so in some ways, uh, he was a great teacher to me. Um, and in another way, uh, by him confronting me and then me being present for him, uh, he got what he needed. Such a beautiful story. Such a beautiful story. And just really letting that drop for listeners and viewers to just really absorb that. The power of presence and the arresting nature of judgment when called out. And how par perhaps, and you know, you said maybe if there's some psychodynamic thing or whatever, perhaps because of that aversion to what that represented in your own life, in your own history, with your own father, with his own alcoholism, that this is just, you know, I'm not going to do this with my life. I'm going to make my life better. I know that I have the power to, as you were saying earlier. So I'm going to do this thing, right? right? But how that's different from overcoupling it with that makes me better than you or that makes me different from you. And this is the um, uh, aspect of this desire for humans to feel superior to others and, uh, and, uh, and how um, it never helps us. Uh, um, and frankly, uh, there is no one who's better than another. Right. And that, that whole thing of superiority or dominance is what we're seeing as problematic for the planet, as problematic for, for racism, for you know whole communities of people, whether it's religious or ethnic or racial, um, different abilities, this whole thing. It, it, by any other name, this superiority or this exceptionalism um, really kind of um, is taken hold in such a way that it feels as though the fear of not being good enough, you spoke initially about love and fear, that the fear of not being good enough is, you know, always reaching for that brass ring, right? The Buddha's craving, right? This idea of never enough, insatiable, um, dukkha, um, the suffering of that, that in reaching for that, that that's different from like efforting and having a discipline or a practice, but that the need to be on top means that there always has to be everything else below. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because having spent a lot of time with uh, different Buddhist practitioners, um, I cannot tell you the number of times who, who people have said, well, you know, I'm just back from my third 10 day Vipassana retreat. Yeah. <laughs> I give a shit. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but again, it's this <laughs> here are these people who are in this world, as an example, uh, who feel the need to tell you that they did this next exercise. And, you know, I always say to them, I said, well, it's interesting you've done three of these, yet you haven't learned the most basic aspect of it. Right, right. right. Uh, I know it, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? That I don't know if it's, it's spiritual bypassing on the one hand. And then there's this other piece of like, well, gee, I'm a, I'm a good meditator. Cause I do it a lot this way. I'm like, yeah, but are you a nice person? Yeah. And, and exactly. And there's an individual who says, well, the way you meditate really isn't the right way. You're not really meditating. I go, Oh really? That's, that's fascinating. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, and the practice I learned, which is, if you want to call Ruth my teacher, we're mm -hmm. but, you know, I know I have not done, uh, you know, a three year retreat in a cave and no, I have not done a million 10 day silent retreats, but I would compare my own uh, self to many others who've done all of these things uh, and have learned nothing uh, or very little. Mm -hmm. And th the thing is, you don't need to go anywhere and you don't need to go on any retreats. Uh, and this is where people get confused because they somehow think if they do more of this stuff, that that's going to magically uh, make them a bodhisattva. And while it may, uh, 
uh, simply being present, kind, loving, non-judgmental, and open uh, doesn't take anything. It can occur in a microsecond without mm -hmm. any stuff. And, and uh, that's where I think some people get lost. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I did a podcast before I had my own here um, on Lama Suryadas's, uh, you know, podcast, uh, Awakening Now, where I was the guest and um, they ended up calling it life is the practice, because I guess that's something I said at some point as a line. And that's sort of how I see it. Although I will say um, that there was a shift that has to do with what you're talking about earlier around self-esteem and positive warm self-regard and the inner dialogue that I had, that I only really woke up to or came into after I spent a night in jail by myself, well, not by myself, but I was with a dozen other women who were right. like, well, I mean, I was, I was, I was in, yeah, I was with other women who, it wasn't their first time there. Right. And many of them didn't have another place to go or someone to bail them out. And that was the point, that was the fulcrum of sort of my transition so the next day I didn't drink anymore. I changed to be a vegetarian. I found this because of my mother, who's also a physician and had gone to a Thich Nhat Hanh retreat um, who had met the somatic experiencing practitioner. I started learning about that. And she was also, um, yeah, she was a mindfulness practitioner. And I read this book that she recommended called There's Nothing Wrong With You, A Guide to Getting Over Self-Hate by a woman named Sherry Huber, who's a Soto Zen practitioner in California. And essentially it was about there's nothing wrong with you and you're heavily conditioned. And that conditioning talks about how and why you come to believe these stories, this narrative, this inner critic that perhaps is trying to protect you, perhaps is trying to do something, but that is really inhibiting you from really moving and shifting into that place of love and compassion and openness that you're talking about. And so I think that that, that inner dialogue around how am I with the me, like you said, it's the most important part, is sort of that fulcrum because I can sit and disassociate for 10 days or two weeks in a meditation retreat and just be watching my thoughts and noting them and minding them, but not, as you say, connecting from uh, the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. I can, I can watch my mind work, but where does that work in my heart? How does that show up with presence? It's interesting. In my house, and I was blessed to be able to design house. At the end of my pool, uh, there is a statue, and it's a modern uh, art sculpture of a Buddha. And um, it has no head. Mm. And it's sitting and it's holding a persimmon. And I bought this sculpture with great um, intention. So the first part of it is that when I see it, and it has no head, it reminds me not to get lost in my head, but to sit with my heart. Beautiful. The other aspect about it is that it's holding a persimmon. And I don't know if you are a fan of persimmons, mm. but the nature of that fruit, I think it's a fruit, uh, is um, that it starts out hard and bitter. Yes. But if you're patient, it becomes soft and sweet. And in fact, this is the nature, I think, of our path is that many times events that occur uh, at the time they occur seem extraordinarily painful and bitter, if you will, and very hard. But then when it, we are distanced from them with time, we see that they are some of the most profound, deep uh, experiences that then give us awareness uh, and they become actually, if you will, soft and sweet, and we can eat them now and appreciate the nutrients uh, from that fruit. Mm. Um, and yeah. so um, I will sit at my jacuzzi like <laughs> statue. Mm -hmm. And contemplate that. Mm -hmm. that nice uh, uh, recentering uh, experience. I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, and again, not everybody, it, not everyone is going to have that particular setup, right? And, and, and you know, that's a beautiful setup. And, and I'm sure everyone can also still find a practice around that, um, inviting that in. Um, right before we close, uh, because this is something that can come as sort of a, 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 an insight, as it did for me, or as, a, as sort of a literally woke up different 
a different, you know, you know, I, I did. I mean, it was overdue, but I'll take it. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Well, you know, this is what people forget is that sometimes a very, very powerful experience can really uh, readjust us to see the world a different way. Now, I, you know, uh, have you ever read Hunter S. Thompson? Mm. Thompson uh, is the, the sort of the genre of writing called Gonzo uh, journalism. Um, but anyway, he made a statement. Uh, he said, I don't advocate the use of drugs and alcohol, but they work for me. But uh, <laughs> right. uh, I don't necessarily advocate horrible suffering and pain to give you self-awareness. Uh, it can. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the ideal. But unfortunately, for many of us, um, reading about it doesn't work. Sometimes we have to have the actual experience. The actual experience. Yeah, it was definitely a, a felt experience, an Olympic experience. Um, and, and, and along those lines, can you just speak briefly before we close about how, if you don't have one of those sort of wake up the next day sort of situations, because I mean, I still had to cultivate a lot, right? And I still am. I'm still, as you said, you're not back then when you were talking to the guy in the liquor store, you weren't the person that you are today. And the person you are today won't be the person that you're going to be tomorrow, right? Or 10 years from now or whatever it is. But what is it about though, actually doing compassion practices on a regular basis that are embodied and presenced that can help change or shift the way that the default neural network or patterning or habit pattern is, is different so that we can engender more of this meeting the homeless person in the eye as opposed to just walking on by? Well, I think, first of all, when you practice compassion with intention, you shift from the fear mode to the love mode. And that's the mode where you have access to your executive control function, where you make more thoughtful, discerning decisions. But in fact, your physiology also works at its best. Your immune system is boosted. The uh, production of inflammatory proteins, which are associated with the occurrence, the chronicity, severity of disease, diminish. Your heart rate variability actually increases, which is a good thing. Your blood pressure goes down. So there are all these extraordinary physiologic benefits, which actually are associated, if you will, uh, with anti-aging. Uh, in fact, uh, there's evidence that your telomeres actually increase in length uh, when you do these types of practices. So this huge, huge benefit. But one of the things I think you said, which is most profound, and I think uh, we can leave the listeners with, is uh, there's a book by Viktor Frankl, which I'm sure you've read, called uh, Man's Search for Meaning. One of the things that Viktor Frankl uh, said, uh, and he was a psychiatrist who invented something called logotherapy, but more importantly, he was a Holocaust survivor, and he could... Uh, tell if someone was going to survive that experience. But one of the things he talks about is uh, stimulus and response. And many of us, when somebody comes at us aggressively or with negativity, we have a tendency to respond in a like manner. And of course, when that happens, we're not being compassionate, uh, we're acting with fear. We don't know what's going to happen. What we forget, though, is that oftentimes when someone is acting out aggressively, it actually has nothing to do with us or even the events at hand. It has to do with the pain that they're carrying with them. And they have not had either the insight, the tools necessary to decrease that pain. And we have a gift at that moment. And this is how we respond to that. Mm. And Victor Frankl talks about uh, the pause, the pause between stimulus and response. And he says that's where our freedom lies. And in fact, it does. We can choose to respond aggressively out of fear, or we can choose to respond with love and understanding and acceptance and non judgment. And when you can do that, if you're able to do that, and it does not happen overnight, and it oftentimes it's not easy, but you will see a remarkable change. Because as I talk about in my book, my time with this woman, Ruth, made me understand that 
the way the world responded to me was how I looked out at the world. And mm -hmm. if I looked at the world through fear, uh, anxiousness, uh, anger, hostility, the world would respond to me in that way. And when I changed how I saw the world, the world changed how it saw me. Mm, beautiful. I love that. That's such a beautiful um, uh, sort of meditation to leave uh, listeners with. Um, once again, Dr. James Doty, the director and founder of, uh, is it Seek Care or Care? Seek Care. See here, okay. Clinical professor of neurosurgery at Stanford University, and perhaps for the purposes of this conversation, um, also the founder and director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford. And again, inviting anyone who's listening to um, go to that website, which we'll share links. And there are classes and courses and different things that you can take in order to establish and cultivate compassion practices in your own life. Um, or you can just start being kind to people and doing the pause as you recommend. And that's the easiest thing, but certainly all of us uh, could benefit from uh, what others have learned. Dr. Doty, thank you so much for joining us on Rerooted today. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Much love. Take good uh, care. Love to you as well. <laughs>